Government Gay, Alex Reynolds series, book one. Writer, Fred Hunter, St. Martin's Press, New York, 1997. Narrator, Eric Arst. Dedicated for Joan Edwards, who told me so. Chapter 16. I stood at the base of the Sears Tower, one of the world's tallest buildings. It is actually a series of towers of varying heights that bolster one mammoth tower. I looked up at the side of the building where I was waiting, the only sign that is a sheer expanse from the ground to the top, and found the site fairly nauseating. I didn't see how anyone could work here, but for my little errand, Sears Tower served a purpose. It was almost 4.30, and since there's about a zillion people working in this building at rush hour, it was the busiest place I knew of, and I wanted to be in the middle of a really big crowd when I met Agent Nelson and gave him this goddamn tube, because at this point, I didn't trust anyone. That was our plan. We'd called Frank and asked him to relay to Nelson, the CIA agent he'd been working with, that we'd found what he was looking for and that I'd handed over to him at 430 at the northwest corner of Sears Tower. Frank would not be coming here with him because he had an errand of his own to run. The crowds had started to pour out of the building and it was all I could do to stand there without being pushed one way or another. Down the street, along with the flow, I glanced at Peter's watch. It was 4.25 and even though he wasn't late, I was feeling awfully antsy. I looked down one street, then the other, tapping my foot when I wasn't shifting from one or the other. It was really stupid to be looking for him like that because I don't know what he looked like, but Frank had explained to me that Nelson did know what I looked like. I wanted to ask Frank how, but stopped myself because I knew whatever the explanation was, either I wouldn't believe it, or it would just make me feel more paranoid. This really was one of those rare times when I thought ignorance was bliss. Four minutes and at least a dozen more glances at the watch had gone by when I saw him. Not Nelson, with a shock that almost immobilized me, then a sinking sense of panic. I saw him, the bogus Mr. Martin. With his appearance at this inopportune moment, I no longer thought he looked swarthy. He looked like the devil himself. My partially paralyzed mind couldn't grasp how he'd found me, but he had, and after the momentary pause in all my bodily functions, I bolted. I fled from the corner and ran for the Wacker Drive entrance of Sears Tower. But the last thing I saw before I fled was that he'd noticed my flight and was in pursuit. I pushed my way through the forceful crush of businessmen and women that spewed forth from the revolving doors of the tower. In the lobby there was a further mass of people pressing one another closer and closer to the doors. I had a sudden horrific sense of having been catapulted into Fritz Lang's metropolis. Though Sears Towers is one of Chicago's most famous buildings, I'd never bothered to come inside it before and was completely perplexed. I didn't know which way to turn and the ever-increasing horde of people didn't make deciding any easier. In front of me there was a huge wall with hallways going east on both the left and right sides. I glanced back over my shoulder and saw a red sea of people parting just slightly as the bogus Martin pushed his way into the building. I knew I couldn't stay where I was because it was like swimming upstream and I was in imminent danger of having the crowd sweep me right back into the arms of my pursuer. I headed to the hallway on my right, about 20 feet along. There was an elevator hallway on the left. I turned into this, just as one of the elevators dinged and people poured out in a way reminiscent of the stateroom scene in A Night of the Opera. As I stepped into the elevator, I glanced back and saw the bogus Martin rounding the corner just in time to see me. Fortunately, the elevator doors closed before he or anyone else could join me, though I doubt if anyone else was going up at that time of day. To my dismay, there was only two buttons on this elevator, 66 and the lobby. What the fuck? I said to nobody, but I realized at the same time I had to press 66 for fear the elevator doors would simply open again if I didn't press something. I hit the button and the elevator sped skyward with a silence that was perfectly ominous. In a matter of seconds the door slid open on the 66th floor and I was greeted by yet another throng so packed in the hallway that they almost fell into the elevator. And they didn't look any too happy to find someone already in there. Pushing my way out into the hallway seemed to start the flow of people into the elevator almost as if I'd broken some invisible barrier that released them as I pressed on down the hallway, my brain kept trying to figure out what the hell to do next. 
and I couldn't think of anything that seemed sensible. The only reason I'd gotten out of the elevator at all was that I honestly thought that if I just went back down, I'd find the bogus Martin waiting for me. At the same time, since the building had several banks of elevators, he might be just as likely to try to find me by following in the direction he knew I'd gone as he was to try covering all the elevators, which would have been an impossible task. I thought movement was better than any other option. As I got out of the elevator hallway, I heard at least three other elevators signal their arrival, and I felt sure that the bogus Martin would be on one of them. The only problem was... Without taking those elevators, the only way to go was up. There didn't appear to be anything on this floor other than a set of escalators that took you to 67. So up I went. I glanced back down when I reached 67, showed that I'd been right. He'd followed me up and I was heading for the escalators. I was sure he'd seen me because I was the only one going up, which made me awfully conspicuous. Fortunately, there was another bank of elevators just around the corner from the escalator, and one was ready when I got there. I jumped on and pressed the button. This was the local for floors 67 through 102. I tried to reason it out and thought I was still having brain trouble. It came something like this. I'd go to the top floor, find the stairs, and start down. The bogus Martin would be hampered by the fact that there were 35 floors from which to choose and he'd have no way of knowing which floor I'd gotten out on. I hoped he would realize that finding me was a lost cause and give up. In the meantime, I would just start down the stairs, which I thought would at least make me feel that I was on my way out of this mess. When I got tired or felt enough time had passed, I could exit out to one of the floors and take an elevator the rest of the way down. I tried to put aside any thought that he might simply go down and wait for me in the lobby. I pressed the button, marked 102. This elevator traveled up with the alacrity of the express elevator. Since nobody stopped it on its way, it whispered to a halt and the door slid open at the 102nd floor. There was a bevy of people waiting for the elevator up here, but all were so anxious to get out of the building and go home that very few gave me any sort of notice. And when out of the corner of my eye, I noticed that a couple of people seemed to be looking my way. I adopted the famous Chicago and I know exactly where I'm going, so leave me alone. Look, I glanced at my watch and headed down the hallway exactly as if I knew where I was going. I hung a right at the end of the elevator hallway and headed down a hall that was lined with identical generic offices. The door to one of the offices was open and through the office window I could see that the late afternoon sky was very clear. I also got an idea of exactly how high in the air I was. Just the view through the window made me lightheaded. Near the end of this hall was the door I'd been hoping for, a rather undistinguished door with the usual red and yellow exit sign. In the distance behind me I could once again hear the ding of the arriving elevators. I gripped the doorknob of the exit, twisted it, and went through. As the door clanked behind me, I immediately became aware of the vacant whoosh of machine noise coming from overhead. Just knowing there was 102 flights of stairs beneath my feet made me feel as if I were about to slide down a gapping black hole into the belly of a beast. I grabbed hold of the handrail and steadied myself. I'm not afraid of heights, I said aloud as if hearing the words would make me believe them. Actually, I'm not afraid of heights, but there's heights and then there's heights. I had already decided that Sears Tower was taller than any building ever needed to be. I could just barely make out the sound of an occasional door opening and closing and the sound of footsteps descending the stairways. Somewhere in the distance. I assumed they were descending because they seemed to get softer. Then another door would open and close and they'd stop. I stood there for quite some time listening and grasping the handrail, and after a while I sank down to the stairs and sat without letting go. I wasn't immobilized with fear, but more overwhelmed with the size and scope of this damn building and the staircase that yawned below me like endless entrails. I had to keep finding a sort of weird falling sensation, the kind you sometimes have in dreams. When I next looked at Peter's watch, it was about twenty after five. Any movement I had heard above the din of the overhead machines had apparently ceased. Then I heard it. A door opened and closed, only this time it was closer than those I'd heard earlier. There was a pause and then I heard the footsteps. They moved slowly, furtively, 
my mind said. I waited to hear another door open and close, but instead the footsteps just continued. They were not receding into the distance, but coming nearer. I stood up quickly, my mind racing. On the one hand, if it was someone who worked in the building, they might realize I didn't belong there, but at this point, I thought I'd be safer if they called security and got the police on the other hand, if I waited long enough to see who it was, and if it was the bogus Martin by the time I saw him, it would be too late for me to get away. While trying to decide what to do, I heard another door open and close a little further down. I peered down in between the railings to see if I could see anything, and I did. There was a hand, some floors down, sliding slowly up the railing. It was unreal, as if someone had taken the scene from the lodger. Where the hand quickly slides down a winding banister and was playing it backwards in slow motion. The hand was moving so deliberately that I have to admit it stuck fear into my already panic-stricken heart. I decided that absence was the better part of valor. But going back out onto the 102nd floor was too risky since I'd be trapped. While I waited for an elevator, then again, since it was the last floor with public access, the bogus Martin might assume that I had been forced to go that way. I crouched down and untied my shoes, then slipped them off. I headed up the stairs as quickly and quietly as I could. Even with the progressively louder machinery noise, I was sure that whoever was below would be able to hear my stocking feet as I climbed the stairs. I realized as I passed the 105th and 106th floor that the machine noise was only part of what I was hearing. The other part was, I think, the fluctuating internal pressure of this part of the building as it was buffeted by the high winds that would be a natural occurrence at this altitude. As I went higher, I could feel the pressure closing in on me as if I were in a submarine that was about to burst. I wondered irrelevantly if this was a phenomenon limited to extremes in atmosphere conditions like those found at great heights or great depths. I passed 107 and 108. There was doors at each landing, but they were locked. The noise was almost deafening now. I paused for a moment, gripping the handrail tightly. After I'd caught my breath, or what little air there was up there, I peeked back between the railings. I had been banking on the idea that whoever it was coming up behind wouldn't think I was stupid enough to go up past the 102nd floor, where I would be trapped. Unfortunately, he did think I was stupid enough. The hand continued its gliding ascent up the railing, only its speed had increased. If I wasn't mistaken, I took a couple of deep panting breaths and went on upward, for some reason feeling dizzier as I went, as if in this closed, windowless space my body could somehow sense the great height it had attained. I finally reached the 110th floor. There was a flight of six stairs. I counted them, with a handrail painted bright red, leading to a heavy metal door. I gulped hard because I thought I could guess where they led. My ears popped. I realized if this door was locked, I was really lost. I decided to take one last look between the railings of the endless staircase, and when I did say saw that my pursuer was still on the trail, I now had accepted that whoever it was was my pursuer because I couldn't imagine what anybody else would be doing up here at this time. I took a deep breath and went up the steps. The door was locked, of course. I hadn't brought the damn gun because I hadn't thought I needed it. I shook the doorknob and was surprised to find that, though the door was locked, the knob was quite loose. I shook it, twisted it, shook it some more, and pulled as hard as I could on it. Despite my panic, I thought I heard very faintly amidst the general din a metallic clink on the other side of the door and realized that the doorknob on the other side had fallen off. I twisted the doorknob again. It was now very loose. I thought it likely that if I twisted a little more and pulled it, the doorknob on my side would pull out instead of something totally unexpected happened. The door popped open. I went through it onto the roof, closing the door behind me. In my determination to get that door open, I had forgotten that I didn't want to be there. I was immediately blown sideways by the winds that howled mercilessly across the roof like waves crossing, crashing over the decks of ships. Unsure I would have gone right over the edge of the roof had it not been for something that I'm really not very proud to report. I swooned. I also learned at the moment that swoon is one of those words that sounds exactly like what it describes. I had swung my eyes around the perimeter of the roof as the winds crashed against me and seen how high up I was. 
Then my head reeled and I went down, flat on my face. The swoon was caused by that feeling that you sometimes get when you are at a dizzy in height. Not that you're going to be blown off it, though that was highly probable under the circumstances, but that some irresistible urge is going to compel you to throw yourself off it. For the first time in my life, I came close to vomiting from pure fear. I would have lain there, digging my fingers into the surface of the roof, were it not for the fact that before going through the door, I had tried to pull the doorknob free so I could take it with me, making it harder for the bogus Martin to follow me, but it wouldn't bulge. I didn't have any time to wait. That was very little cover on the roof. There are two huge antenna poking up into the clouds, the lights blinking steadily because this goddamn building is so goddamn tall. They have to warn approaching planes of their presence. And there was a variety of large metal box-like things jutting up from the floor as if they'd sprouted there. I didn't know what their purpose was, but I thought they'd serve my purpose. I crawled toward the nearest one on my hands and knees, afraid to stand erect for fear I'd get blown off the building. And then I rolled over on my butt, bracing my back against the box. The city spread out before my eyes, the altitude so high and the view so clear. I felt like I could see the curve of the earth. I felt the breath going out of me and my head going light again, so I closed my eyes and shook my head quickly. My stomach sank and I felt as if the roof were shifting beneath me. When I opened my eyes again, I noticed something that almost made me doubt what little sense I had left. There were two enormous hooks standing ominously on the very edge of the roof, with a complicated series of ropes and machinery around them. I was trying to figure out what they were, therefore, when I heard another noise. Above the roar of the wind, I heard the metal door fly open, banging against the wall. I knew at that point that if my heart didn't stop before the day was out, I would live forever. I turned myself around slowly so as not to make any noise, as if anyone could have heard me, raised my head up carefully and looked over the top of the metal box, behind which I'd taken refuge, standing in the doorway, his tailored suit flapping around him violently in the wind, was the bogus Mr. Martin. I dropped down and rebraced my back against the box. Reynolds! he yelled. It sounded like a voice calling from a storm. Reynolds! You're out here! You must be! Of course, he received me no answer but the howling of the wind. Reynolds! I'm not who you think I am! And I don't think you are who you think I think you are. Were the words my mind silently spun out as I replied? Alex! He yelled as if my first name would get more of a response. Alex! I'm Agent Nelson! Agent Nelson of the CIA! Commander Frank O'Neill set up this meeting between you and me so that you could turn over the information you found. Oh, God! I thought in a mental panic unlike anything I'd ever known. I can't believe anybody. All these people who knew something or other about each other or are about to ferret out information that they can use against people or to bamboozle people the way this very man had when he'd first come to our house. People who told you they were one thing and turned out to be another. People who were plausible liars. People like Victor Haycheck, who hadn't given a second thought to endangering the life of a total stranger. Oh, God, I thought, I'll never again know what to believe. I was suddenly overwhelmed by a feeling of loneliness that was total outside my experience. And with it came that same unnerving sense of being compared to throw myself off the building. I made a mental note that I would never challenge heights again if I lived. Alex, please listen to me. I am Agent Nelson, and I've been working with your mother's friend, Frank O'Neill. I know I told you that I was James Martin, and you know that that was a lie, but I had my reasons. If you'll come out and come down with me, I'll explain it to you. But I need for you to turn over the object that Victor Haycheck gave to you. The welfare of a lot of people in Russia, Americans in Russia, depends on me getting that. Apparently, he turned his head this way and that to look around the roof from where he was standing by the doorway, and so his voice came and went on the breeze which gave it a strange, disembodied effect in my giddiness. I thought this entirely appropriate because I didn't know who this man was. I didn't know if he'd ever give me his real name. There was a hundred questions I wanted to call out to him. 
that I thought wanted explaining before I could reveal myself. The trouble was that if I called out, I would reveal myself, and I couldn't do that. Alex, you have to believe me. What Victor Haycheck gave you is the culmination of several months of work. And without it, all that work will be wasted and many, many people will be in danger. The worst part about it is somebody from the inside is in on it. From inside? What? My mind asked. Somebody inside the CIA is working with them, Alex. I need the information. Haycheck gave you. Look. His tone became much more rueful, at least as much as was possible in the wind. I know what you and your family have gone through these past few days. I know you don't have any reason to believe me, and what I'm asking you to do is to go beyond that and take a chance. Take a chance that I'm telling you the truth. Come down with me and Commander O'Neill, and I will explain the whole situation. I promise you, I ask you to believe me. My head sort of rolled involuntarily on my shoulders as if the swirly mess in my mind was working its way out. I had one thing to say for his argument. Taking a chance that he was telling me the truth now that he was actually Agent Nelson was probably no more risky than any of the other chances we'd taken lately, and there was the fact that he had come to the bottom of Sears Tower at the appointed time, which would indicate that he had talked to Frank. But could I even trust Frank, on the other hand? I told myself Mother had not been able to locate the bogus Martin when we set our, her plan for rescuing Peter into action, but it was just as likely that this man had followed me to Sears Tower. But then, how did he know about Frank? I tried to remember the look on his face when I saw him, to see if it could give me a clue as to whether he had been surprised or shocked, or looked as if he were simply coming to meet me. But my mind spun, and I couldn't grasp the picture. Alex, please! I was torn between the idea that if he didn't come out onto the roof looking for me, I could just sit rooted into this spot forever and he would go away in the idea that I might as well give up and take a chance on trusting him because there was no other way out of this anyway. I opted for the later. But I wanted to have a look at him first, so I turned around again slowly and inched my head up over the top of the box. There he stood slightly outside the door to the roof, he had his arms wrapped around his middle, and both his suit and his usually well-groomed hair flapped madly in the breeze. But other than that, he looked serious. I can't explain it better than that. Suddenly, before I raised myself up, his head snapped forward just slightly, and he looked completely startled. Then his legs wobbled, and he started to fall. Behind him, in the shadow of the doorway, was a hand holding the barrel of a gun, the hand grip of which had just been used to knock him cold. Once he'd hit the ground, I saw the person who belonged to the hand and the gun. It was the real James Martin. I thought flitted across my mind on the breeze and didn't stay. The second door slammed. The second door I'd heard open and close in the stairwell. It had never occurred to me that someone might be pursuing my pursuer. The whole thing came clear to me now, as I suppose it does to people on airplanes who know they're about to crash or people stuck in a car caught on the railroad tracks. Just before impact with an onrushing train, it came to me in the form of questions. Why would an ordinary personnel director carry a gun, even if he worked for the CIA? And what the fuck would he be doing up here? And how had he found us? The real Martin wasn't supposed to be in on this. How had the pencil-pushing personnel person known about this meeting? And the answers to a few questions started to come to me, like why the big clay person, Foman, had met me under the overpass, and why Martin had reacted in such a peculiar way when Mother had asked him about Matthew Corbin and the other men on the list. Why in the back of my mind there was a small nagging doubt that there might be plausible explanation for these things. But I have to give myself credit in one respect. By this time, my ability to give the benefit of the doubt was gone. I knew. Unlike the bogus Martin or Agent Nelson, as I supposed I was going to have to believe he was, now that he'd been rendered useless, the real Mr. Martin began to search the roof immediately. But his search was pretty slow, going since every direction he turned, he seemed to be walking against the wind. For someone who was obviously out of shape, he was doing his damnedest to hold his own. I knew it would be only a matter of minutes before he discovered my hiding place, unless I was able to keep moving around out of his sight, but this seemed impossible. 
there was too much space between the big metal whatever the fuck they were, and I knew he would see me if I tried to shift to another one. That sort of thing only works in the movies. I inclined my way over to the side of the building, in between the giant hooks. Huge, thick ropes were coiled around them and hanging off the building. The remaining rope coiled beneath it and through a mass of some unidentifiable machinery. I decided there was nothing for it but to look over the side of the building to see what it was. With my eyes closed, I slowly pushed my head over the low wall that rimmed the edge of the roof, then opened them just barely enough to see in hopes that I could blur out the drop below. Through the slits, I could see it, a window washer scaffolding, hanging about six feet down from the top of the one side of the building. It was a sheer drop to the ground. I closed my eyes and said a brief silent prayer because I knew in a flash that I had to do. The only hope I had here was that even if he searched behind every possible hiding place on the roof, he wouldn't think I would go over the side. And that's exactly what I did. I grabbed one of the ropes hanging from the giant hooks so tightly that I might have flattened the thing in my hand, took hold of the edge of the wall with my other hand, and hoisted myself over the side, lowering myself onto the platform of the scaffold. I lay on my back, letting that sickening, rushing, falling feeling wash over me as the scaffold was buffeted against the side of the tower by the howling wind. Though the scaffold had high, sturdy sides, I still felt I couldn't stand on it. I looked straight up at the sky at the two antennas shooting up from the top of the tower, their red lights slightly dimmed as they were engulfed by a passing cloud. I closed my eyes and prayed again. I felt as if I had been laying there forever though I'm sure that my sense of time had taken a nosedive off the side of the building. It could have been seconds, but it felt like hours. I didn't look at the watch because I felt that any extraneous movement would send me hurtling down the 110 stories to the pavement below. I've often heard that when someone falls or jumps off a building, they die from heart failure before they hit. Though it has never escaped me that there's no empirical evidence for this, I wasn't ready to have the point proven to me. When I felt I had stayed there long enough, when I could take it no longer, somehow these two feelings magically coincided with each other. I started to devise how I was going to get back up onto the roof. It really would have been a simple task had it not been so far down to the ground because it wasn't that far back up. It just required me to grab the ledge and pull up as I kicked my legs over the wall, but somewhere in there would be a moment no matter how brief, when my feet wouldn't be touching anything. That bothered me. I had just gotten myself up on my knees and was bolstering myself to get up the rest of the way when he came. Martin's head, shoulders, and right arm, the hand at the end of which gripped a gun, suddenly loomed over me. I recoiled slightly, but my brain was quick enough to realize that I had nowhere to go. It finally occurred to me, as his pasty, paunchy face hung there above me, who it was he reminded me of. Sidney Greenstreet, in every movie he ever made, he no longer looked like the back-slapping good old boy he'd appeared to be in his office. Now, he looked like a demented senator. It irrelevantly crossed my mind that this was redundant. Give it to me, he barked, all the good-natured pseudo-southerness gone out of his voice. Give it to me, his right hand was turning white from the tension that with which he was holding the gun. I chose not to answer because I couldn't think of anything to say. You fucking faggot! You've been in my way ever since Haycheck got here. But it's gonna end now. How? How? I started to say, but no more words would come out. I follow you, you idiot! I've been following you since you left my office, since you asked me about Matthew Corbin. Then I knew you knew too much. I knew you were on it to it. I knew we had to get rid of you right away. I've been following you with a little flick of his head over his shoulder. He added, I suppose that's the guy that Washington sent out here. I gulped and said, I suppose it is. Then he'll die after you. Wait, wait, I said frantically, trying to think of a way to stall him. Please, I've got to know something. Why did you set me up the other night? Why did you send me to the overpass and send Foman after me? I mean, you knew where I lived. Why didn't you just kill me and my family there? He smiled in a way that made my skin crawl. That smile said that he thought he was really clever. Because we weren't after you. 
I didn't know who the feds had sent here, and I had to flush him out. His mouth twisted, just the way you tried to flush me out with the fucking fake matchbook. That's why I had you set up a meeting with that fed foeman was supposed to take care of both of you. But your friend over there, he gestured with a gun back toward where Agent Nelson had fallen, didn't fall for it and didn't show up. Then who shot Foeman, I asked. Not me, he replied with a broad, satisfied smile that made my blood run cold. I was at home with my wife. He pushed the gun nearer to me, all the time. At first, I thought you just got mixed up in this by accident. We did! He shook his head as if to signify, I shouldn't have bothered. First, you met Haycheck in that bar, then you come up with the names of all the people we've, they've kidnapped. Then you need me to fed here. You sure led us on a chase. You sure have. But it's over now. You know that? You must have Haycheck's evidence on you. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been meeting that fed. Give it to me. Mr. Martin, there was all a mistake. Don't you understand that everything we told you in your office was true? I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. I wasn't meeting Haycheck, and we really did think it was the matchbook you were looking for. I half wondered why he didn't just shoot me and get it over with, but it crossed my mind that there was an outside possibility that if anything remained of my remains after a 110-story splat on the pavement that someone might find the two. That doesn't matter to me anymore, he said, and he pushed the hair back off his forehead. Sweat poured off his brow, but he made no attempt to mop it up as he had in his office. Once I get that damn evidence and get rid of you, I'll be home free. This one really required a weighing of my options. I held tightly to the rope and stared up into his eyes, which looked wilder to me by the minute. Finally, I took a deep breath and said, No, you won't. For the first time, he looked uncertain. What do you mean? If you've been following me since we left your office, then you know that I found Peter and rescued him. So what? He barked, his voice reflecting that he was not happy with this subordinate. In order to do that, my mother diverted your friend Volkov to the Lincoln Park Zoo. The real pool, the seal pool, to be exact. Where he followed us a couple of days ago. Yeah, so what? So when I was sure that Peter was safe, we called Police Commander Frank O'Neill and sent him to the zoo to pick up your accomplice. And I can pretty much count on him doing it one way or the other. He's a damn good cop. So, he demanded less sure and more angry, so what's that mean to me? Do you think Volkov will stay silent when he's in custody? He'll probably tell everything he knows. So what? Nobody's going to believe some fucking Russian over me. With the CIA after you? And if you kill me? God, that logic came out of nowhere, but it made sense to me. The only thing was, even with making sense, I wasn't sure it would make any difference to Martin. A startled lurk came over his face, then his brow furrowed. Then something so unexpected happened that I had nothing for it but to act instinctively. He lunged at me, yelling, You fucking bastard! He didn't shoot, he just grabbed at me, and his action threw him off balance. Without thinking, I reached up and caught hold of his shirt and yanked on him. A choked croak came out of his throat, with his being off balance and the angle at which I'd pulled him, and the overhowling wind, he seemed almost to glide over my head. He went sailing off the building over me, over the scaffolding, and fell screaming down the concrete canyon to the street below. Out of my sight, out of my hearing. I slid down to a sitting position, my head against the part of the scaffold that abutted the tower. I closed my eyes. In my mind, there was a blissful silence. The irregular rhythm of the scaffold as it knocked against the tower was almost reassuring. After a few minutes, I climbed back onto the roof. I found Agent Nelson where he'd fallen, though he was rousing. He turned over on his back and was holding his forehead as if the impact of the gun, but against the back of his head, was rebounding against the front. When he saw me coming, he pulled himself up into a semi-sitting position. I offered him my hand and said, Come on, Nelson, let's go home. I pulled him up and he swayed uneasily for a moment. I put his right arm over my shoulder to support him. I'll help you, I said. Hurr, he said, putting a hand to the back of his head where he'd been hit. As we approached the door, he said, Reynolds, the next time somebody's chasing you, go down, not up. 
Everybody makes the same damn mistake. If you go up, you're trapped. Go down, for God's sake. Go down. You have no idea how many men have said that to me, I said as we started down the stairs. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold. To offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. Reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.